Sustainable Cell Development Podcast, episode 37 with Jenny Blake. Hey guys, it's Abel here with the Sustainable Cell Development Podcast and this week I'm coming at you with a very special episode and a rather new type of episode for my podcast and it is with author, blogger and podcast host Jenny Blake. Jenny is a former Google employee who has a pretty fascinating life journey. She initially became known for her work with the book Life After College, which was about how you can build the life that you want and succeed once you got out of college. And now she has written a second book called Pivot, which is about how you can manage big shifts and changes in your working career or make the changes that you feel you need in your life at times that you feel stuck and how you can do it in a way that doesn't flip your entire life upside down. So if you feel like you're at crossroads in your life when what you're currently doing is not making you happy, so you want to make a change, but at the same time, you don't just want to mindlessly leave everything behind, this podcast episode will be interesting for you. I really like Jenny's book, Pivot, because it's one of those pieces of work that doesn't just give you phrases that sound good on paper but are kind of non-actionable and vague it actually provides you with practical actionable advice that you can use which is important because it's really not about how you feel while you're reading a book but how you can actually put it into practice and implement it so i highly recommend that you check out jenny blake's book pivot and with that let's get into the interview jenny thanks so much for being here and how are you Thank you for having me, Abel. It's an honor. I am doing well. It is finally just starting to turn to spring in New York, so that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. It's the same here and in the part of the world where I am. Although it's, uh, you know, it's, it's always funny when you are at a, at a place where people have a clearly different heat tolerance than you have. Right. And it, it reflects in how you dress and everything. It, it's really funny. Like I'm already boiling and other people are still walking around in jackets. So right. yeah, uh, the first thing I want to say is that I just told you before we started recording that this is a big moment for me. I mean, I followed your work for a while. Uh, I read your books and, um, you know, I know that you have a podcast as well and that you've had the chance to interview a lot of people uh, who you have been following around for a while. So I'm just curious, like when you get on someone on your podcast, who is, you know, a very influential person in your life, you're looking up to that person. Uh, what's your, like, how do you feel before you hit record? I'm always so nervous. And I don't, I even have spoken now a few times in front of a thousand people this year since the book came out. And I'm more nervous getting onto a podcast with one person who I really admire. And I have to say, even after I hang up, sometimes I'm feeling like, oh man, I was so nervous or I forgot to ask something or I just have to accept that it's not going to be perfect, but hopefully listeners will get the gist of it. And that dropping the need for perfection around the podcast is what allows me to keep going. Because as you know, it's so in the moment. It's so spontaneous. The best ones really aren't planned. And so you just kind of go with the flow. And I've had some interviews with author heroes of mine that went super well, and I couldn't believe it. And then others that were really awkward. And I didn't know why, and I didn't know how to fix it. But I think it's just being willing to keep going no matter what. Yeah. Have, have you also like hoped sometimes that one of your interviews that you've been waiting for the most, like that you almost wish that the person would cancel because you were so nervous before? <laughs> That's so funny that you asked that. I know that feeling that you're talking about. Sometimes, like sometimes, or when they do cancel, I'm like, phew, okay, I have a whole nother week to prepare or even just yeah, get mentally yeah, ready. Yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, and then, then Parkinson's law, right? Like it, the preparation will always take as long as what time frame you give yourself and you will always just get ready in the last minute, or at least I do, <laughs> usually. So true. And then I realized that with a lot of my podcasts, I was treating it like a book report. I would hone in on all these questions from their book 
And I realized that's not necessarily the most fun for the guests because they're kind of reciting the same things over and over. And so actually some of the podcasts that I enjoy the most are where I don't really plan in advance and I have their bio and I know a little bit about them and I just surrender to not knowing at all what questions are going to come next. And I try and be genuinely in the moment and just curious about whatever they've said previously. Yeah. Yeah. And then I guess that's, that's on a whole other level when you actually meet these people in real life at an event or something. Like I, I honestly can't even imagine how, how that must be, but it must be pretty wild. Have you met anyone in person yet that you were really excited to meet? Um, you know, I'm actually just about to, no, actually, yeah, one time, one time it happened, uh, a famous uh, Hungarian psychologist. So he, he was kind of a big deal for me. Yeah, it, it was interesting. Like it's always, always one of those things that the other person is not necessarily seeing what's going on inside. Whereas inside, you know, that like wars are ruling inside of you. Right, uh, right. Uh, yeah, my boyfriend and I just went to South by Southwest and we got to, we saw Tim Ferriss recording a podcast live and then we waited in line for probably an hour to get a book signed by him. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. what do you say to Tim Ferriss when you're face to face and you have 30 seconds? And we were just like, we're obsessed with your books. We've read every single one. You know, <laughs> it was like just the funniest interaction because you're trying to squeeze so much of what this person has meant to you in such a little window. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but one thing to keep in mind here is that I and I think I heard this from you, actually, that that the moment you place someone on a very high pedestal, that's kind of the moment where you make it much, much harder to have a, a genuine interaction with them or to actually develop a, a relationship of any kind with the person, right? I would say that's true. I mean, yeah, I try not to put people... But at the same time, some of my best interactions, at least on the podcast, were when I was just like, I'm obsessed with your work, you know? And I just was very genuine about... So people have even said to me about my podcast, you're just a fangirl. Like you basically just interview all these people that you're, you're geeking out over. You're so excited. It's contagious. So in some ways I don't hold myself back from, from really sh showing and telling people what they've meant to me. And I know it's a little awkward. I know that it is, but at least they get the idea for how much their work has impacted. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I, I brown my nose on my podcast shame, shamelessly. <laughs> like I'm totally comfortable with that. But um, so my first first question to you would be a pretty weird one, actually. I, I've heard you mention a couple of times that you've read some like four or five hundred personal development books. And I kind of just if you do the math, that's, you know, like eight to ten thousand pages of self-help literature. And I would be curious, like if you had to do like a, an analysis of some kind, like what percentage of that would you say was like actual actionable valuable advice what percentage of it was just filler and what percentage of it would you say is just like non-actionable bs kind of thing <laughs> yeah if something's total bs i do stop reading it what i look for in a book is one nugget if there is one nugget in there that makes me think differently gives me an idea or changes my behavior for the better in some way, I consider that book a success. So it's okay with me if not every single page is gold, as long as there's something I am taking away. And what I'll say is that the goal for me is not always that every single book provides the most new and different original thinking. Sometimes I'm on a subject, like one thing I'm curious about at the moment is dissolving fears that I've uh, adopted this new motto, agitation is an invitation to freedom. Anytime we are agitated, upset, angry, jealous, sad, uh, uh, insecure, unsure, there's an invitation there to look at that fear and dissolve it. And so I've read every book by Byron Katie, every book by Gary Zuckov, every, you know, I'm just now reading Eckhart Tolle again the second time. I've read every book by Penny Pierce. I've reread her books twice. So in that sense, not everything that they're all saying is new and different on every page. Certainly not when you dig, dig into like six books by the same author, but it reinforces a certain concept day after day. So it's almost like I'm not a, associated with any one religion. So instead of reading the Bible every morning, I'm reading like a cornucopia of development books that go in themes. And that's what keeps me reminded of whatever I'm working on. So sometimes I welcome the fact that it's similar 
similar but a little different and it's just hitting the same message home from different angles yeah yeah and 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 one thing to keep in mind for people is that um there are books that people just pick up because it was rated highly on goodreads or amazon or whatever and then it might be a really good book, but it just might be completely irrelevant for their lives at that moment. And so then they kind of, uh, you know, evaluated it as the book as kind of just, yeah, it's a pretty mediocre book, whereas they should probably just revisit the book in some years or months or whatever, because at that time it might be completely revolutionary to read those same lines, right? That's so true. Yeah, there are books I've read where I read it initially the first time, and only grasped a fraction of it. Like Byron Katie's Loving What Is maybe got 10% of the gist that which is, okay, anytime you have a stressful thought, you can choose a different one. And for, for five, six, seven, eight, nine years, that's the one nugget I was able to integrate from that book. If I have a stressful thought, I can choose a different one. But now I'm rereading her work, let's say almost 10 years later, and it's fascinating what I'm learning and being able to apply the nuances of how to how to actually turn a thought around and how to change it and how how many times a day I'm actually letting stressful thoughts in and how many opportunities and so those are nuances that I didn't get the first time around because I probably wasn't ready for them right right and um to kind of uh, make the transition here that one one reason why I really liked your book is because it did have those very nuggets that you just mentioned which is like actionable okay that's cool like i can actually do it there are exercises in the book which which we are going to touch on but so to to give a kind of a crash course to people on your work and and what you do um you first got into the the blogosphere and whole book writing kind of gig with your book and your blog life after college right Yes, exactly. That was my first book. And I started working on Life After College while working full time at Google. So I was at Google from 2006 to 2011 and started a blog on the side, really not thinking it would become anything at all, but eventually decided I wanted to write a book. And so when the Life After College book launched in 2011, I took a leave of absence from Google and ultimately decided not to go back. Right. So have you like uh, careers and, and how to kind of get ahead in life and, and kind of craft yourself a meaningful working life? Was this something that always interested you for some reason? Or did these things always come about through your own kind of mini struggles and roadblocks that you hit? Yeah, so much of it comes from my own struggles with uh, with something. And what I realized was even beyond career and business is something I feel most sure of talking about because I have worked in these areas the longest versus let's say writing a book about relationships. I kind of feel like I'm not qualified to be doing that mm -hmm. given where mm -hmm. I'm at in life um, or parenthood. You know, I haven't had kids. So these are topics I don't feel compelled to talk to tackle, at least not yet. But uh, even beyond careers, I'm so fascinated by change. And you're exactly right. It's through my own challenges and struggles that I, that I then, I'm so close to it and I'm so perplexed by it that I want to solve it both for myself and then eventually help share those systems and resources with other people. Right, right. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, when we talk about Pivot, uh, your your book, which, which is a recent work of yours, um, would you give kind of a 10,000 foot view first? Like, how did that come about? I mean, obviously, I, I know the story uh, from you, but a lot of my listeners may not know it. So how did that come about? And what is the general message that you're trying to convey with it? It came about when I was two years into running my own business after leaving Google. And once again, I was facing the question, what's next? Because I had become known as the girl who left Google, the girl who left college, but who am I looking forward? And this time I didn't have a steady paycheck to fund that exploration. So it was a lot more nerve wracking trying to answer this question this time around. And that's ultimately what sparked working on Pivot, which was wanting to get better at figuring out a next move or a next direction, because especially as someone who's self-employed, I had to, I had to figure it out in order to stay in business. And so Pivot, the book is a method to map what's next. And it's based on a 
three stage framework. There was a fourth stage launch of you finally go all in, but a three stage method to help you double down on your strengths. Look, look ahead to what does success look like a year from now, kind of scan for people, skills and projects related to those two things, and then run pilots or small experiments to test the new direction. Right. So, um, now I have to, like I have to admit that I I've, I've never talked to a person who had been working at Google and certainly I myself am quite far from from such uh, heights but you know like if you're if you're up for it like let's first kind of deconstruct the whole um kind of idea behind behind having a satisfying career so um so first of all like what do you personally think of these phrases like follow your true passion or find your passion or follow your heart and those kinds of things. There, there is truth to them where it becomes tricky is when people feel bad if they don't have a passion or they don't know what their heart's telling them to do. So if you have a passion, great. Yes. Take small steps. Don't put pressure on yourself to make it your full-time anything, but do an hour a week or 15 minutes a day, whatever is within your realm to be able to do. And, and then I'm big on what I call in the book project based purpose. So instead of having to know what your entire life passion is, what are you excited about for the next year? If there's one or two things that you could tackle and learn more about and pursue, what would those things be? Right, right. And uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting, because I mean, obviously, these these kind of phrases are pretty popular these days. And what I like about your book is that your kind of encouraging people to do it but you're doing it in a more pragmatic more methodical way and so it, it kind of bulletproofs people from making a, a blind leap and you know just leaving stuff behind uh without contemplating it i thought that was really cool thank you yeah I, it was important to me to to give those really practical i love that you said pragmatic next tools for next steps because inspiration alone doesn't pay the bills and uh, like I said, this time around with my pivot, I had to figure it out to pay the bills, to stay in business, to stay living in New York. And so I wanted to give people very specific, concrete solutions while also helping them figure out the big picture, but to give both so they could really work their way toward a next move more organically. Right, right. And and I would highly encourage people to, I mean, you know, what people should know if they pick up your book is that it's kind of an interactive sort of book. So there are certain uh, exercises that you have to go through. Well, I guess you don't have to, but <laughs> it's, it's there to actually do them. And so I would highly encourage anybody who who reads your book to actually sit down, preferably in the morning with some caffeine, because then it's ex extra fun and, and actually go through the exercises. But so staying on the on the theme of, of careers, um, you work with people and you can uh, advise people on, on these sorts of issues. And obviously, you made several changes in your career as, as well. So when we look at traits that make a career um, satisfying and meaningful for people, are these traits uh, completely individual or are there some general traits that you see that are important for people if they want to make their careers very satisfying? Hmm. They are individual. Some There are some universal traits that people would say, for example, in Pivot, I talk about growth and impact. Are you learning and growing? And then ultimately, are you making an impact? Uh, some would say autonomy is important, feeling like you can call the shots. Uh, approval and recognition is important to some people, feeling seen and like they're really making a difference and their work matters. So uh, beyond that, some people value security and they might want a full-time job that's giving them a steady paycheck every two weeks, while others may value freedom. So you have mm -hmm. the freedom to move about where you want. And for you, it's probably a worthwhile trade-off not to have a paycheck necessarily every two weeks, or maybe you get it from a few different client sources, but it, you kind of, you're okay to cobble it together. Um, and so, so that's, I, I have in the, in the book, something I call the pivot hexagon, where there are sometimes opposing values like freedom and security or time and money. And how do we navigate that? We might want all of the above. So what's just what for us, what's our unique formula that hits on as many on each side of that spectrum as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and 
People, I mean, I, I noticed this on myself too, that, you know, in the past when I heard that, you know, not everybody has to earn a certain amount of money to be happy and it's not equally as important for, for all people. In the past, when I heard that, it kind of made me freak out. Like I almost viewed uh, settling for a mindset like that as a form of just um, claiming mediocrity uh, in a way. And then, and now I'm realizing that, yeah, like having time affluence and, and just being flexible with my time and those kinds of things are just so much more valuable for me. And I'm, I would be totally willing to give up a lot of comfort in my life if I just could have, you know, unlimited time flexibility, location flexibility and all those kinds of things. So yeah, I, I like that point a lot. And like you said, those values and priorities can shift over time as well. So they may grow and evolve as we do. Yeah, totally. So um, you mentioned that uh, this concept of, of making an impact, and there's this uh, subset of people that you describe in your book that are called impactors. So what would you classify an impactor? Like, how would you how would you describe that? Impactor is somebody who is really driven by the desire to make a difference. And I share my purpose statement, and I say, feel free to borrow it is I'd like to be as helpful as possible to as many people as possible. Beyond that, I'm not attached to what forms it needs to take. I don't say, oh, I have to be a writer or else, or I have to be a speaker. These are things I actually enjoy speaking more than writing, but writing helps me get the initial ideas out in a book like Pivot that leads to speaking. So, um, yeah, I think for me, that's, that's really what an impactor is, is somebody who's saying, how can I serve? What do people need? How can I be most helpful? And that how may change over time, but that the drive to contribute and to, I know it sounds a little cliche now, but make the world a better place and, and uh, help improve people's lives. But it is, it is genuine that that's what an impactor really seeks to do. Right. So let, let's just, just tackle the, the obvious question here is like, do you think there are people who are like kind of by trait or kind of genetically or whatever, but just are more predis predisposed to want to be an impactor? Or like, do, do you think that all people share that kind of desire at, at some, some level? I think that some are born feeling it and then some kind of go through a struggle and that some will never it's not everybody has to be an impactor. Some are like, it's like, I'm the, I'm the primary breadwinner for my family. And my way to make an impact is to support my family. And that's fine. You know, and that's their own version of being an impactor. It doesn't have to be. And then I'm founding Facebook. Um, but then some people I think will go through a phase of having, not really having as much meaning and impact in their life or career as they would like. And then at a certain point realizing there's more to life than this, or there's more to work than this. And only in going through a somewhat of a crisis mode or a really soul searching time, they come to reflect and realize, okay, I think there's more out there. And I think I can, I want to, even I've talked to some coaching clients where they're in their fifties and they're just saying, okay, I've had a very successful career. I'm at the top of my game, but now it's legacy time. Now I want to stop working in sales. And now I want to move towards something that I really feel is will leave a legacy behind. Like on, on the theme of, of career changes and, and making kind of sharp moves in your career, you have a, a pretty cool formula in your book, like certain stages that you have to go through if you or like you advise people to go through when they make a change. Uh, would you just uh, briefly describe these steps and, and what they entail? Yeah, kind of like I described earlier, I didn't use the stage names, though. Think like a basketball player. So when a basketball player stops dribbling, they plant with both with one foot, and then they can scan for opportunity with the pivot foot. So the first stage plant is about what's already working. And where do you want to end up one year from now? From that really solid base, that solid foundation. Now the pivot foot can scan for passing options. And that would be people, skills and projects that are connected to what's already working and what success looks like a year from now. Then the third stage pilot is like passing the ball around the court. Where do you have the best opportunity to make a shot? So pilot is about small experiments that help test the waters of a new direction. And you can repeat plant scan pilot over and over as many times as necessary until you get to the fourth stage launch. And that's really where you go all in and there may be some uncertainty remaining, but you're ready to launch in the new direction. Right. So, um, 
would you like give an example of like how you applied this in, in your own life, for example? Yeah, even with, you know, the book coming out. So the book launched in September of 2016. And I didn't know exactly what would happen after that. I'd been working on it for three years, building different business experiments behind the scenes. So when it launched, I had different programs like Momentum is my private community for solopreneurs and side hustlers. I trained six pivot coaches to be able to provide coaching for people who read the book and wanted more one-on-one support. I had corporate speaking and workshops and then licensing. And I even created a pivot workbook and a pivot one hour workshop in a box. And I just had no idea. And I had the podcast. So these are all pilots that I had lined up and I really had no clue what was going to take off after the launch. And even now I'm still in observation mode. And so it's been cool to just see what's picking up steam organically, what I might need to pour a little more effort into, but to just this time around still not know, but be more relaxed in that and not knowing and to have a process now for saying, okay, of everything I'm doing, what's working the best and do I want to invest more time into? And then what can I drop or delegate? Yeah, and I, and I really, really uh, like that that approach because especially now, I mean, you know, kind of we live in the the era of the four hour work week ish kind of mentality, which is very popular, which, you know, don't get me wrong. I think that was an, an awesome book. But uh, even, you know, Tim Ferriss would agree that, you know, just leaving stuff behind blindly and just, you know, making a 180, as you call it is is like that's not the approach that is advocated in even his book and i would be curious you know like you have a lot of clients that you work with do you see that often that you know, they, they're inclined to just all of a sudden leave everything behind and leap into the you know unknown passion project whatever yeah i mean different people have a different risk tolerance and some will be willing to leap and others will want to work their way there. So I wrote Pivot for those who weren't ready to just take a blind leap, but they want to work their way toward it. And um, and I think it's up to each individual. But I will say that nobody I talked to who launched or kind of took the leap in the end, no one has regretted it. Even when things didn't exactly work out as planned, they could see that, oh, yeah, that's what I needed to do at the time. You point out in your book that kind of you have to define a certain amount of leeway that you give yourself financially should things not work out? Mm. Yeah, definitely. I talk about in the book having at least six months of pivot runway. And the more runway you have, the more risks you can take. Whereas if you have less runway, you you will be more constricted and you'll need to develop. Um, you'll just need a little longer to get whatever it is you're doing off the ground. So one of the things that I also recommend is it's okay to have what I would consider a career portfolio. And so even if you're self-employed, this is the whole thing of having multiple streams of income, that if any one were to go away or be affected, all of your income wouldn't go with it. Yeah. And and that's the thing, like kind of now, I think everybody thinks that they should be an entrepreneur, right? Like that's, that's like the thing now, if you're cool, you're an entrepreneur. And it's not really about that. Like it, it can be just a means to create extra security, basically just setting up multiple revenue streams, like you're saying. Right. Right, exactly. And, and then especially if you're self employed or working on a side hustle, you can't always know what the market's going to want or what to do. So it's a combination of listening, and, and then experimenting. And you're right, there is so much of a, in the zeitgeist of like, everyone should, everyone should become a digital nomad. And that may or may not be best for each individual. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, like, not to be not to be too apathetic here. But you know, do you think that there is such a case where someone wants to make a change in their careers when that person just simply doesn't have enough skills to a to make a, a move anywhere, really, <laughs> and b that they would even have the potential to make their current job enjoyable for themselves, because they just simply don't have the means to shape their own working life in a way that could be fulfilling. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's possible. I think w- no matter what level you're at, the the best way to pivot is to look at what do you what do you have going for you. So even if you are early in your career, or you can't get to your biggest pivot aspiration overnight, what's the one next small pivot that you can make? And sometimes it takes a few smaller pivots in a row to work your out your way up to the big one. Right, right. So just to just to give people some kind of practical advice here, like what are 
what are surefire signs that like you can actually look for? It's like, okay, if this is happening, that's a sure sign that it's time to to make a change of some kind. Uh, what would be those? Yeah, definitely physical symptoms. If you're getting sick more often or um, sometimes for people, it just manifests physically like headaches or a sense of dread going to work. Um, and then for others, it's more of a, let's say before it gets that serious, a kind of a gut instinct. Like, I think there's more out there for me. And, um, or they're so compelled by a new direction or a vision or something you've read or seen out there that the vision alone is exciting enough to pull you forward. And that kind of goes with gut instinct too. And then, and then another, there are more practical concerns. Like maybe someone knows it's time to pivot once they've saved a certain amount of money or once it reaches a certain date like i'm gonna quit my job before the holidays things like that yeah yeah and i don't know are you familiar by any chance with the cal newport's book so good they can't ignore you absolutely yeah i love that book yeah and like basically what you're saying kind of resonates with what he calls career capital where if i'm interpreting it correctly what you're saying in your book is that let's say you want to make a change and there is usually a way to make that change that initially you would think that you have to completely you know change your your path for you can usually make that change in your own field as well in some way so let's say you you dream of becoming a writer and you're into science of some kind you don't necessarily have to become a, a fiction writer right away like probably you can write a lot of cool stuff within your field yeah absolutely exactly and that even working on small writing projects can be totally rewarding i think one thing is just taking the pressure off of all or nothing thinking, thinking that unless I can be a full-time writer, I won't do anything at all. No, awesome points. And uh, last couple of questions for you. These will be kind of random, but I'm very curious what you will say to these things. So first of all, if people are experiencing, you know, a quarter life crisis kind of thing, and by that, I could even mean things like, you know, just, I don't know if you ever had this in, in your life. I, I know I had it several times where I'm like, oh my God, I'm 20 years old or tw 25 or 30 or whatever. And I'm, what have I achieved? What have I done? Have I fulfilled my potential or whatever? Uh, when people have these almost panic attack, like anxiety breakdowns, what would you, what would you say to these people? Yeah. One is breathe and try and as much as possible. It's usually just fear that is very natural, especially with career change that comes in. And so try to just come back to right in this moment, what's one next step and just worry about the one next step and try not to, because I did this, beat yourself up for not having the answers or for being in this mode in the first place, because ultimately that's not productive. And I spent too much time beating myself up for not having the answers. And instead, if you can just kind of get present, get still and, and just right. no, understand, awesome. okay, what's the one next action I can take? and not worry too much about what to do after that. No, oh, that's awesome. Kind of a random question here. Were there any kind of habits uh, that you developed or adapted in your own life in recent years that have been big game changers for you? Meditation is definitely one of them. Some combination of daily meditation, reading, journaling, exercise, that's the stuff that really keeps me sane, getting enough sleep, and then bonus connecting with friends and, and, uh, but those are the things that I really, I really have those self care practices that I need in order to be at my best. Actually, I know that you have been talking to Cal Newport, who is, who is one of my favorite people in the world. And you had him uh, on your podcast and you were talking about his work, uh, deep work. And I'm curious, like you who, you know, obviously you, recently published the book you're doing your you still have to do i guess you know go to events promote your book whatever how do you apply some of those lessons in your own life if you have adapted any of them yeah well i love cal's message around deep work and although i'm not off social media altogether i really don't pay much attention to it and so it's nice to have cal's work and cal himself kind of validate that hey, it's okay if you don't want to be on Facebook and Twitter. And I was just so grateful to read that. It was helpful to see it because ultimately, uh, if I'm not doing strategic work, I want to be outside or just doing something else. I don't necessarily want to be on social media. 
So that's one practice that um, really stuck out from deep work. Right, right. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty much the same way. And, and actually, like, uh, I don't know if you agree, but to me, social media is is kind of almost like gives people a full sense of competence in many ways because they post something, they get a whole bunch of likes, and it gives them that full sense of security. Like, oh my god, I'm making progress. I'm so cool. Whereas you just posted something that's funny and it's really not that meaningful. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. And uh, and I think also what I love from Cal's book that I adopt as well is I look for when am I most creative in a given day and I make sure that that's, for me, it's in the morning. I do that before I even check email. So instead of letting email, sometimes I, I fail at this, but letting it run my day, I really try and set aside that those golden morning hours for things that energize me and then my most important work. Yeah, yeah. If you win the morning, you win the day, right? Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah. All right, Jenny, I think you dropped a whole bunch of golden nuggets here and I really appreciate your time. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you think would be valuable to mention here? Thank you so much, Abel. I don't think so. I'm just really happy to be here and kudos to you on all that you're doing and your pivot and all, any pivots in progress and just wanted to say a big thank you to everyone who's here listening and if you want i have a bunch of free templates from for a lot of the stuff we talked about that's all at pivotmethod.com slash toolkit right and and your book can be found on all the major places where people buy books right yes exactly yeah all right guys abel here again hope you enjoyed this episode if you did please subscribe on youtube if you watched it there i come out with new content every week there whether it's in the form of a podcast episode like this which i actually aim to do one off every week or some shorter informational video also if you could just leave a comment and suggest some people that you'd like me to interview or just topics you'd like me to cover uh, it would be very helpful to know how i can better serve you and if you listen to it in podcast format if you could leave a rating on itunes it would greatly help out the show and i would be more than grateful for it so thanks guys for hanging out up until now thanks for being here and see you all next week